applied here. If we go back to nitrate, where nitrate had this Lewis structure here, and then it had the other two equivalent structures of moving the double bond to here, and then so we moved to here. So that's four electrons so far in the pi system. And then, so that would put the double bond over to here, and that would make the single bond here. And then we can have these two electrons move as well. So that would be six electrons in the pi system if we're counting. So you're kind of counting the unique electrons that can move throughout the structure for the pi system. Or better put, six electrons in the pi system. The pi system might make a little more sense too when we come back to this topic in chapter nine once we kind of look at orbitals and, and look at what our pi electrons are, kind of like double bonding electrons, we often call the pi electrons. Single bond electrons are like sigma electrons. So the pi system are the electrons that are resonating in these systems. So six for nitrate. As I remember to move this one. Good morning, everybody. So we're going to get started back in uh, chapter 8, still talking about Lewis structures. So the um, main part of today's, the first half of the lecture, we'll look at resonance and what, what's going on in um, these resonance structures. So if we look at the Lewis structure of ozone, um, so for ozone, we have three oxygens that are connected. So if we use our usual Lewis structure rules, how it is that we come up with these two Lewis structures that are shown here would be kind of applying the usual rules. We have our central O. Our non-central oxygens have their octet filled with lone pairs. We might count up our electrons. Six valence electrons per O, so that's 18 total. And so we've used 16 so far from the two O's, getting their octets, so that's 16 electrons. So the two left over go on to the central atom. And so at this point here, the central atom is deficient of an octet, only has six electrons surrounding it, and then also has a positive charge. We actually have a two plus charge if we think of the formal charge in this oxygen. So think about the pull of the nuclei of one of the O's being able to pull in one of the lone pairs to make a double bond. So we lose the lone pair on one of the O's, make a double bond. Now you might think we would, we might think of doing this a second time, because this kicks the charge down to plus, because we now have six minus five instead of six minus four. So we still have a positive pull on the nuclei of the central oxygen. We still have a negatively formal charged oxygen on the other one, but we don't have a room. We don't have like an octet, excuse me. We have our octet filled, so we don't have room for another electron pair. So we can't do this and make that second double bond. So that second double bond doesn't happen and we stay with just one double bond. And so when we look at the octet, the octet would be thinking about all the electrons surrounding an atom formal charge is cutting the bonds in half. So cutting the bonds in half isn't the octet. The entire set of electrons surrounding an atom would be the octet. And so we have eight electrons, and that's the max for the second row. So that's the maximum of electrons we can have for an atom in the second row of the periodic table. Um, third row, we see some structures where we expand octets, like we saw SF4, SF6 last time had expanded octets. When we see those structures, it's going to be for third row and bigger atoms. Like if you think of the analogy to um, like the SF6, like OF6 doesn't exist. It exists as a compound. So having oxygen as a central atom, six fluorines, that, those electrons are too close together. Um, you need a bigger central atom to fit those six bonds around that bigger sulfur atom. Now back on the ozone, we have one Lewis structure that has, you know, again, lone pair, double bond, single bond between one of the O's and single bond between the other O. And then you could also say, well, why don't we make the double bond with the other oxygen instead and kick those electrons over and just move that double bond? And this becomes one of those cases where the single Lewis structure doesn't really compel the molecule to exist as one of those Lewis structures. So the real molecule is never really, let's call one A, the other B. It's never really A and B going back and forth. It ends up being more of a real time compositing or averaging so that the real structure looks more like this. We have our lone pair in one of the oxygens, and we have that extra bond spread across the two oxygens sort of simultaneously. So if you think on average of having a double bond between the one, a single with the other, it averages out to be about a three halves bond. 
sometimes we call this a bond order. But just think of a double bond as being two bonds. So a double bond has a bond order of two. Single bond has a bond order of one. The bond in ozone would be about three halves, kind of right in between single versus double. And we've seen before that single bond's longer, double bond's shorter. This bond should probably be somewhere in the middle between the O2 double bond distance and what we'd expect for a single OO bond length. Um, we'll talk about bond lengths in another slide in a couple moments from now. But for now, if you actually look at the electron density map of ozone, you see that the two O's on the outside look the same. They look the same because you have the compositing or the averaging of the double and single bonds at all times. So this is more the picture of what ozone really looks like in terms of its real structure. So it's the average of its two resonance structures. So we have resonance structure A, resonance structure B, they're equivalent, but they're just different from each other. So the real molecule will composite those structures out or average those structures out. Now you might think, what's the charge on oxygen? Well, we alternate between zero and minus one. Notice how if you look at one of the O's here, it's zero, over here it's minus one. And so if you average that out, it's minus a half. So each O has a formal charge of minus one half. So in one Lewis structure or one of the resonance structures, it was zero. The other one, it was minus one. And then there's two possibilities. So we get the minus one half from taking zero plus negative one and dividing by two. Just like we get the three halves bond from taking the two bonding pairs of electrons for the double bond plus the one pair of electrons for the single bond and dividing by the number of OO bonds. And so what the two plus one divide by two to get three halves, what this comes from is the number of bonding pairs of electrons and we're dividing by the number of bonds. Zoom in, so we have two, four, six electrons, so that's three pairs of electrons being spread across the one, two covalent bonds. So we have like two sets of OO bonds and then three pairs of electrons being spread across. So, so yeah, two dots here and then three here. And then notice that we're, we get the double bond by two of these electrons moving in to make that double bond. So if you take two off of the 1O, make the double bond. Like this one here? Well, yeah, yeah, so what I'm ignoring in this structure here is I'm not really paying too much attention. What I'm thinking is, is you're taking the, um, the double bond from one, switching it to the other, and you have an electron pair kind of kicking in. There's like a question, it's not one of my favorite, which is like how many electrons are in the pi system of this molecule? And so you would have um, the two electrons you're moving in, so like these two electrons to here, and then these two electrons to here. So you'd have four electrons in the pi system of this molecule. And then when you sh show the compositing, it's really hard to show the lone pair electrons on the O. Um, so I think when, whenever you're showing like the, averaging, the average structure here, it's easier to neglect the lone pair electrons. So here I'm just kind of thinking about that double bond switching to here and averaging out, if that makes sense. And then to, to look at the lone pairs, I really need the resonance structures to see the lone pairs. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so one other thing we might say is that ozone, four electrons in pi system. We'll point this out for another structure or two for counting electrons in the pi system. It's kind of counting the electrons that would be moving to make the different Lewis structures. Um, and so let's think about how this impacts bond length. Yeah? 
Okay, so let's look at how uh, resonance and um, these impact bond length. Well, the one thing for ozone would be that if you're picturing ozone from the previous slide with its averaging and compositing, is that the two O's have the same bond length because they have the same average bond. So each of these o oxygen bond lengths are the same. They're of like a three halves bond order and they're identical to each other. So one of the bonds in ozone isn't like shorter than the other one. So it's not alternating double, single. It's always like a three halves bond. So when you think of ozone, again, it's not an A and B equilibrium going back and forth. It's like a real time compositing of this being the real structure for ozone. Again, having a bond order that should look a little longer than double. So if you think of O2, O2, has that double bond. We have six electrons times two, so 12 valence electrons. And so we have our double bond between the two O's. And then hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, peroxide is that O2 two minus group. So this is where we have a structure that looks like this. Their hydrogen's connected to oxygen. Now, how do we know this, or how do we get to the structure of H2O2? Well, one way is if you just picture each of the O's being a central atom and kind of apply our usual rules. If we count the electrons here, we have two from the hydrogens plus 12 from the oxygens. That's 14 total electrons. That if we have 14 electrons so far, we've only used two, four, six, that we have eight electrons left to go, and we just kind of start filling in the octets on our non central atoms. And so we end up with those extra lone pairs. So you can get there from our Lewis structure rules. You can get here from just a dot structure too. Sometimes you can get to a Lewis structure from just like a dot picture where we're connecting, like how one of these looks like an O, this other one looks like an O. So we're just pairing up the unpaired electron and then do the same thing with hydrogen. And the last thing you might do is just count the electrons to make sure you have the proper number of electrons used. So just making sure we can see how to get to a Lewis structure of H2O2 for hydrogen peroxide. But hydrogen peroxide is just a molecule that has a single OO bond length, or single OO bond, compared to a double bond in O2, compared to this three halves bond in ozone. And so if you're predicting which molecule do you think has the longest oxygen-oxygen bond? Well, probably peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, because it has the single bond. So the bond of, o2, uh, of oxygen and H2O2 should be longer then the three halves bond in ozone, and then the O2 bond should be the shortest. Because our double bond, the bond order here is two. So double bond, two electron pairs being shared. The bond order three halves for ozone, and our bond order for H2O2 for the OO bond would just be equal to one for a single bond. So bond order is just the number of bonding electrons being shared between the two atoms. And you could look these up. Like if you're, if you're curious, you can Google these and, and double check if you want or look them up in different uh, resources. But it's about 1.2 angstrom for O2. It's about 1.25 for ozone. And then it's about 1.4-ish for hydrogen peroxide. Now you might then wonder, well, why isn't it exactly in the middle? Or why isn't ozone exactly in between if it's a three halves bond? The answer is there's some like charge being exchanged here. That, remember how you still have a plus minus a half? So you have a little bit of electrostatic forces that are gonna shorten the bond just from kind of like a lattice energy perspective. So just plus and minus attracting those atoms a little bit closer together. So we, um, we often sometimes will ask about bond link trends because it usually becomes a marker for having the right Lewis structure and the right understanding of resonance. So you might see uh, some questions that ask us to compare bond links of molecules and it's usually trying to get the single bonds are longer, double bonds are shorter, if you have a three halves bond in between. Uh, what about a four thirds bond? Sometimes like the bond order in nitrate is like four thirds. If you go to like nitrate and one of its Lewis structures again from our discussion here is that this is a molecule that would have about a four-thirds bond order because you have the four pairs of electrons being spread across the three NO bonds. And so if you're comparing nitrate to some NO bond that's like three halves, the three halves bond probably a little shorter. So you can just kind of rank order the bond order here and how it ties into ranking the trends of bond lengths of molecules.
And so it kind of becomes, sometimes you'll see a question that says like for NO2 minus versus NO3 minus, I think there actually is a question on this at some point in the notes, which bond's shorter? And it kind of comes down to looking at the Lewis structures, evaluating their bond orders, recognizing that all the bonds in nitrate are actually the same distance. One of them isn't shorter than the other two. All three bond lengths are identical. So all the bonds are identical at an order of about one third, or uh, uh, four thirds. And then you can tie that into comparing trends with something that's three halves or something that's two or something that's one in terms of predicting length trends. Let's come back to sulfate. We looked at this Lewis structure before. So in sulfate ion, we had two choices for Lewis structures, if you recall, sulfate. Uh, we have uh, six for sulfur, four times six for oxygen, plus two for the minus two charge. That's 32 total electrons. And so we had two Lewis structures that we'd come up with. One satisfied the octet rule. It was just single bonding, everything following the rules that we were kind of taught on Lewis structures to start with single bonds, octets on the non-central atoms, count our electrons used. That's all of them. And the only issue is, do we make multiple bonds or do we stick with the octet rule? And so this was our octet rule Lewis structure. And then if we want to minimize magnitudes of formal charge, we might notice that sulfur has a plus two formal charge. So if we use the formal charge idea, we're going to make double bond here, kick this down to plus one. What was a minus one O now becomes a zero oxygen. Let me just remove that O here now. And so now this oxygen's zero. And then we can do this again. It doesn't really matter which oxygen I use. Um, so I'm going to use the one here. I think it's a little less confusing if we just put them side by side. So we kick the electron off here, make another double bond, kick the charge on sulfur now down to zero for six minus six electrons surrounding it for zero charge, zero for O, and then minus one for the other oxygens. Now for sulfate, you could imagine we could sketch all of the other permutations, it would take a while, I'm not going to do it. You can put the double bond here, you can put the double bond here, you can move both the double bonds around and come up with all kinds of resonance structures. The idea would be for sulfate, if you're picturing the, um, the formal charge rule Lewis structure, this one, then you might have to picture resonance, but you're going to still come to the idea that all the SO bonds should be the same length. So through resonance, all of the bonds here should be in order of what? Well, I would say we have one, two, three, four, five, six pairs of electrons. So six bonding pairs between the S and the O. The oxygen on the top of the right hand side might have, sorry, not one electron, it took two and made a double bond. There were two before, and it took two, and now we're sharing that. There, there were three pairs on each of them when we started. So I took one of the pairs off to make the double bond. So I just shipped two electrons from a lone pair to be a bond pair. So, so we're not losing the electrons, we're just moving them. We're just, we're just going from having, so we're just going from having, let's just picture one O kind of separate. You're just going from having this structure to having that structure. So both of those are eight electrons being used. So you have two, four, six, eight electrons here, and then you would have had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight the other way. No, no. So, so this is like the Lewis structures would arise. The reason why we might sketch these Lewis structures is we have the positive charge initially on sulfur pulling the negative electrons in. All right, let, let's rewrite the, the first Lewis structure. So this is our first one. This is our octet rule Lewis structure. And then once we minimize the magnitudes of formal charge, we came up with this one here. And then these O's are as they were before. And then we just have the permutations of all these other electrons participating in the pi system. So we have two, four, and then six, and then eight electrons participating in the pi system. Okay, so sulfate would have eight electrons in this pi system if we're picturing our formal charge rule Lewis structure. This is our octet rule Lewis structure. 
Now, let's look at the question, though. Let's see what the question was actually asking. The question is just asking, which statement's true? Are all the bond lengths in sulfate the same, or are all of them different? And it doesn't tell us which rule for sulfate to think about for the Lewis structure, because it doesn't matter. If you look at the octet rule Lewis structure, you would say all SO bonds are the same length, just because they're all single bonds, so they should all have the same length. And if you're looking at the formal charge rule Lewis structure, you might think at first glance two of them are shorter than the other two, but then you think resonance kicking in, then all of them are the same length. So even if you picture the formal charge rule Lewis structure, all the bonds are the same length. So the goal of this question is just to make sure that we're seeing through resonance that equalizes the bond lengths to the structure, and then we don't really have two shorter versus two longer bonds in sulfate. And so we're just kind of ruling out that two of the bonds are shorter than the other two, even if we're looking at the formal charge rule Lewis structure, that we're going with all of its bonds in sulfate have the same length. Now, if we wanted to say which Lewis structure is best, I don't think either one is best. I mean, truly, I think the octet rule Lewis structure is best. But on a test, I think we would say, if we just want you to give us a Lewis structure, we would say, give us a Lewis structure in which all atoms satisfy the octet rule, then you would answer this Lewis structure. Or if we said, which Lewis structure of sulfate minimizes magnitudes of formal charge, then you would say this Lewis structure. So neither one of them is quote unquote best on an exam written by committee. And like I was saying, I think this one's best, but that's just between us, I suppose. Okay, so now sometimes you see the word localized. Now sometimes this is confusing, but a localized double bond is just like a normal double bond. Like a structure that just has, like O2 has a localized double bond. A localized bond means it's exactly where you think it is. And so this would be a localized bond. If you looked at like carbon dioxide, those are localized double bonds. So we have double bonds exactly where we think. And then when we see ozone like this, this is what we call then the delocalized bond. So the fact that we can make this bond here, and um, let me rewrite this. So if I move that electron pair in here, kick this electron pair off, this is delocalization. So this double bond here is delocalized. So delocalized meaning spread across multiple centers, not localized to always be between those two atoms. So a delocalized bonding comes through resonance. So resonance equals delocalized bonding. So when we start looking through the molecules on the list, CH2O. Now again, you may be a little confused in the thinking, do I bridge hydrogen in the middle? We're not going to have hydrogen bonded to two things. Hydrogen forms one bond. So we're going to have two hydrogens on carbon, and then we're also going to have the oxygen on carbon. And then if we start thinking of our Lewis structure rules, we did this Lewis structure before, I think, or something like it. You could start with the lone pairs on oxygen, because we give you know, a set of lone pairs to the non-central atom. We think about the charge on carbon being plus, room for a pair of electrons, so we make a double bond. And so we end up going C double bond O, um, and then to the two hydrogens. Okay, so then we see that double bond in uh, formaldehyde, that that's just an ordinary double bond. Like this double bond isn't sometimes here and here. So that double bond doesn't exchange with the hydrogens. It's always localized between the C and the O. So we get an ordinary localized double bond in OF2, or in uh, CH2O, I mean. In OF2, you guys remember the Lewis structure here? But the idea is, if you forget the Lewis structure, and really, I would make sure to not just flashcard Lewis structures. Always know how to sketch a Lewis structure if you're not sure. And if you see one a few times and you come to memorize it kind of accidentally, that's fine too. But you might remember OF2. We had just started with the octets on fluorine. We might count our electrons used. 6 plus 14 is 20. And then we've used 16 so far. So we have four electrons left over. Those go on to oxygen. So central O with two lone pairs, two single bonds to fluorine, zero formal charges all the way around. Oxygen's in the second row. We wouldn't expand its octet anyways, but so we're good here. So we um, are at a good Lewis structure for OF2 with single bonds, so no double bonds at all in OF2. And then carbonate's another one of those ions that has resonance, like nitrate ion, we'll see. So for carbonate, 
four plus three times six plus two for the two minus charge gets us to 24 electrons. So central carbon. Minus charges on the O's plus on carbon. And then we have room for an electron pair. We can minimize the magnitudes of formal charge with a double bond. So we can make a, uh, a double bond and lose those electrons here and then place them as a double bond between the C and the L. And then of course we could do this with the other double bond here. We could do this with the other double bond here. So we can make two different double bonds at one moment in three different Lewis structures that then average out in the real structure. So the real structure is going to have four of those bonding pairs spread across the three CO bonds. So this like nitrate is one that has a four thirds type bond and that we're just resonating through that extra double bond. So we have one double bond in carbonate um, that resonates through the molecule. Um, so we have a delocalized bond. So like one third of that bond is delocalizing in the CO bonds each of the times at all times in CO. So a delocalized bond in carbonate makes it not a localized bond. So the only one with a localized bond, so a bond between the two atoms is in formaldehyde. Yeah. The four, so carbonate, again, let me just do this sketch here. It's one, two, three, four pairs of electrons being spread across the, then you count the actual bonds. So four pairs of electrons spread across the three bonds. So yeah, bonding pairs divide by the like actual number of covalent bonds. Okay, now uh, we had talked about a few octet rule exceptions. There's a couple others, and there's a few like diatomics that are kind of interesting in terms of how we might come up with their Lewis structures. Um, so let's take a look at, um, this is like hydroxyl radical. So OH minus is pretty easy. Like if we do OH with a minus charge, it'd be six plus one plus one. You know, that's just oxygen single bonded to hydrogen. And then we end up with all those lone pairs on oxygen satisfying the octet of that um, oxygen. And so this would be um, OH minus. We also have the negative formal charge on oxygen. And so then if we're going to kick an electron off to go to hydroxyl radical, the only place to really kick an electron off is one of those lone pairs. So for the um, OH without the charge, where we only have six plus one for seven electrons, that we're going to choose to leave you know, hydrogen with its bonding pair electrons, and we're just going to kick a lone pair off of oxygen. It doesn't matter which of the faces of oxygen I take the lone pair from. But I'm just going to take one of the lone pairs off of oxygen, and it's going to be deficient of an octet, because we only have seven electrons. So we're less than an octet with oxygen, and that's OK. Um, and the issue here would be if we kick an electron off of hydrogen, there's no electron to kick off. So we can't easily kick off a bonding pair electron. The lone pairs are going to be easier. So if I go to NO, it could be easier if I go to NO minus first, because we talked about NO minus previously, where we had 5 plus 6 plus 1 for 12 electrons. And then we ended up with the Lewis structure, just kind of like O2s, where we have NO with a double bond. And if this is what you're picturing as NO minus, then I think you can probably envision the question for NO without that extra minus charge. So if we only have NO with 11 electrons, so if we're kicking an electron off, you can imagine two different electrons. So we can kick one of the electrons off of nitrogen. If we do that, you'd have this structure here. Or you could say, well, what if we kick the electron off of the oxygen here and leave nitrogen intact? So if you recall, I mentioned how we can use the formal charge rule sometimes to, to, um, to try to evaluate two Lewis structures that appear to be pretty similar. Um, Similar in that one of these atoms is breaking the octet rules. Just do we want it to be the N or the O? Let's use formal charges to help us out. So the formal charge of nitrogen in our first structure is 5 minus 5. So this is 0, and then this is 0. Oxygen 6 minus 6. So our formal charges in N and O are 0 and 0 in NO. With the first structure with the nitrogen having the extra electron loss off of it, 
And then the NO other one, where we have the electron kicked off of oxygen, would have a negative formal charge on nitrogen for five minus six electrons. And then oxygen is going to be plus one. Should have six, only has five electrons surrounding it. And so this is plus. And I think we're probably savvy enough to recognize that oxygen is more electronegative once electron is more than nitrogen. So why would electron go positive to let nitrogen be negative while oxygen breaking the octet rule to do so? The answer is it doesn't do that at all. So it's going to stick with the zero formal charge structure. So when we're evaluating through possibly equivalent, or equivalent's not the right word. When we're evaluating potentially correct Lewis structures where the correct number of electrons are shown, um, the, the bonding, one of the, elect one of the atoms has to break the octet rule, so only one of the atoms is breaking the octet rule in each structure. We go with the structure that minimizes the magnitudes of formal charge. So we want these magnitudes to be lower, um, and that's going to make that Lewis structure be better than some other possibility. So then if we go to CLO, again, we might start with CLO minus, might help us figure out which atom we want to kick the extra electron off of. But this would be um, 7 plus 6 plus 1 for 14 electrons. And so for 14 electrons, that's going to look like F2 or Cl2, just with a single bond between these two atoms. So a single bond here. And now this one might be a little trickier in terms of what the best Lewis structure is, because we might be, like, depending on how we apply the rule, we might end up with the wrong structure. So let's just think of the two possibilities like we did before. So let's kick an electron off of chlorine for one structure. And so that'll look like this one here. And so then if we go to starting from the same Lewis structure and just kick the electron off of O, we're going to kick an electron off of oxygen. And so now if we kick that electron off of O, let's calculate our formal charge here. So let's start with this structure here, calculating formal charges. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, so zero. And then chlorine here is seven minus seven for zero as well. And then if I go to this Lewis structure over here, we have chlorine with one, two, three, four, five, six electrons surrounding it. So that's seven minus six for plus one. And then oxygen should be minus one to balance it out, but it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it's six minus seven for minus one. Now, if you think of electronegativity, you might want to pick this structure here, but this structure is actually not the right structure. So this structure here is wrong because we've actually maximized formal charges. So formal charge rule says we try to minimize the magnitudes of formal charge for the best Lewis structure. So we want the lowest possible formal charges. Now you may have said, well, but the left structure was putting more negative charge in the more electronegative atom. Isn't that good? Well, it kind of is, but it's better that we start our Lewis structure where we're going to picture kind of like the formal charges being what they are and then think about electronegativity. So if we think about electronegativity now, we can think about the oxygen becoming more negative. But it's not going to be more negative than minus 1. It's going to be somewhere between 0 and minus 1 in terms of its formal charge. If we picture this structure here, we might be thinking, OK, it's minus 1. Oxygen is more or less negative. So it should be even more negative than minus 1. And if you find that the real structure has a charge less than minus 1, then that's somehow chlorine pulling electrons back off of O. It just doesn't make much sense on why we would start with the minus being on O already, and then chlorine somehow stealing some charge back. I think it'd be better to start with the charges at zero, then think about electronegativity. Electronegativity of oxygen pulls electrons more closer towards itself, picking up a partial negative charge. So the best Lewis structure is the one that allows us to get the charges sort of like minimize, then we think about electronegativity, then kind of kicking oxygen more electronegative to be slightly more negative and chlorine to be slightly positive. OK, so for diatomic molecules, the fission of an octet, we're probably most easily picturing the anion then losing an electron, trying to envision which atom loses the electron. We saw an example earlier of BF3, where BF3 was perfectly content having six electrons around boron. Um, that gave it a zero formal charge. So we looked at this structure before. We ended up with the Lewis structure that kind of looked like this, where we had 24 electrons distributed through a single bond and three lone pairs on each F, 3 plus 7 times 3. So we only had 24 electrons. So this is fine because we have a zero formal charge on boron. 
to make a double bond to satisfy the octet rule would increase the magnitudes of formal charge. So we don't want to increase magnitudes of formal charge when we could have left them minimized at zero. And of course, the real fluorines should go partial negative here in the real molecule. The actual charges on fluorines, more or less negative, more negative, not positive. So we're not making double bonds here. And it's OK that we have less than an octet for things like boron and BF3. And then BEF2 is another one where this comes up. Beryllium only has two valence electrons. Again, uh, 2 times 7 for 16 total. So this is just beryllium, two fluorines, lone pairs on the F. Beryllium only has two valence electrons, it has two surrounding it, has a zero formal charge. So beryllium's like boron, but it just has one fewer valence electron, therefore forms um, just two bonds with fluorine. Both single bonds, not double bonds. And it's okay to be deficient of an octet on something like beryllium. Then we saw third row atoms can expand their octet, so we saw a lot of examples last time of things that expand their octet. Okay, so the last section in chapter eight gets back into a little bit of a discussion of, of um, bond uh, strengths and bond lengths. And so, um, you know, we see both of the same bond uh, strengths that we saw from chapter five. There's not a whole lot maybe left to discuss here other than maybe pointing out things like HF. Remember how HF had the greatest of partial minus and positive charges? That gives it a really strong bond compared to the other halogens. So notice the HCl, Br, and I are weaker in bond length. And a lot of this has to do with those partial plus and minus charges strengthening that bond. And so this is why HF was actually a weak acid from chapter four, not a strong acid. So it has that different trend where it has a much stronger single bond between its atoms, so it's going to be harder to break that bond in, in water. So HCl, Br, and I were able to do it. These were strong acids, if you remember. And so that's a big difference between HF from the other halogens is the strength of its bond. And so um, electronegativity differences in atoms can strengthen a, a bond strength. Um, I don't think we ask too many trends of just like a polar versus a nonpolar bond, but there's a lot of uh, uh, trends you can make with bond lengths. If you lengthen a bond, you generally weaken it because, again, you're stretching out the electron pairs. If you can shorten a bond, generally you strengthen it. And if you can polarize the atoms, generally you're going to strengthen the bond as well. Um, then uh, we mentioned before that double bonds are shorter. A shorter bond with um, four electrons being shared between, say, two carbons has a much stronger bond. So notice the bond strength between two carbons with a double bond, 614 kJs per mole. The single CC bond is only 348. And so carbon-carbon uh, single bond weaker than a double bond. So more electrons uh, we add between the atoms is strengthening the bond. If you go to a triple bond, even stronger. Nitrogen-nitrogen um, triple bond, really stable bond, really strong, hard to break takes a lot of energy, 941 kJs per mole, but the NN double weaker, the NN single is actually very weak, 163 kJs per mole. So single to double to triple, triple bonds stronger than single bonds. The bonds are shorter, more electrons being shared, more glue between the nuclei. And so this here is just kind of comparing some bond length trends for single, double, triple. So for the carbon atoms, you can see that we are um, shortening the distance as you go to a triple bond. Same thing, you know, you can compare different atoms, you get the same trend. Single bonds longer than the triple bonds. And this is just comparing a bunch of different atoms kind of in their single versus double versus triple bond length trends. Now, like, this question here kind of becomes um, very analogous to something we saw in, chap in chapter five of estimating delta H's using bond strengths. Um, the only difference between this question now versus chapter five is you know the structures or you can use the idea of like working out a Lewis structure for these atoms. In chapter five, we would have to show you the Lewis structure. So we can see questions like this in chapter eight where you just have to work out for C2H6, well, that's having two carbons as our central atoms. And then we're gonna have three, C8, three hydrogens on each. We're gonna have O2, we now know that's a double bond. We know that's a double bond from this chapter here. So we have seven O2 double bonds. And then we have two of the um, ethane molecules and then we form four CO2s. So that's gonna be four carbon oxygen double bonds times two. So we have two double bonds between CNO and CO2. And then we're gonna form six water molecules. Or we have the OH single bond. 
And so now we can be able to take this reaction here and see, okay, we'd have to look up the CH bond strength and multiply that by one, two, three, four, five, six. But then there's two CH, uh, uh, two ethane molecules, so we have to break 12 of the CH bonds. We're gonna have to break two carbon-carbon single bonds. We have to break seven O2 double bonds. So we sum up the bonds and the reactants. So this is that weird one where it's the sum of the bond strengths of the reactants. How much heat does it take to break all the bonds versus how much heat do we get back when we make the new bonds? So this is reactants minus products, and then we sum up the bonds and the products. So I have four times those two bonds in CO2. So I'm gonna have eight times the CO double bond strength, and then plus six times the two OH bonds. Now it's funny, like you know this reaction is exothermic, right? Like, like it's a combustion reaction. We know this reaction would take place with the flame. We know it should be exothermic. So the delta H here, just from the nature of this reaction, if we remember from chapter five, should be exothermic. And it's really exothermic, you know? Like there's a lot of heat given off. And I actually know from the choices, and maybe you do too, I don't know, but it's gonna come out to be minus 2831 more so than any other number. But like if we wanted to double check this, we would just be literally plugging in the CH bond strength, the CC single, the O double bond. I'll let you guys, if you want to look those up and just double check the math, but it's going to come out to be really exothermic and it's going to be a big number. Um, and I know that just from the nature of this type of reaction. But so we can use the bond strength chart to approximate delta H's and maybe understand and appreciate structures a little more in chapter eight than in chapter five. And you get a little bit more of a predictive capability of the bond type, triple bonds being stronger and also shorter than their counterparts, double and single bonds. Okay, so as we proceed into you know, the next chapter, it actually continues along. We're gonna be writing a lot of Lewis structures in chapter nine. There were two slides on Lewis structure examples I'm gonna post separately. Um, so I had a couple pages of some extra Lewis structures. I'm just gonna put a little short video of those up um, after class. Um, so, and we're gonna see in chapter nine, we're still sketching Lewis structures because in chapter nine, we're gonna wanna go into, well, what does the molecule actually look like in three dimensions? And so we're almost always gonna have to start with the Lewis structure. Um, first, that we can picture how many bonds are there, how many lone pairs are there, what type of bonds are involved, so that we can come up with the shape of the molecule. So chapter nine's on molecular geometry and bonding theories. So shapes, something called Vesper model, that's like valence shell, electron pair repulsion. So as you start to think of those words together, it's like the valence shell electrons are the ones participating in bonding, and electron pairs repel each other. And so the electron pairs and bonds and the lone pairs are gonna to try to spread out and use space as best as they can. We're gonna then try to talk about molecular polarity versus bond polarity. From chapter eight, we could look at differences of electronegativity and say if two atoms differ in electronegativity, that would make the bond polar. Molecules have to be situated in such a way for the molecule to be polar, so we'll talk about that. In fact, let's bring up an example right now because it's a really interesting example if you counterpose CO2 with water and that both of these have polar bonds, right? Like the differences in electronegativity are pretty big between carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Oxygen is really electronegative. N, O, F, C, L are the most electronegative elements. And then also sulfur and like bromine are pretty electronegative as well. And so if you pair one of those atoms up with anything else, it's going to be polar. So the CO bond, definitely a polar bond. The OH bond's definitely polar as well but only one of these molecules is actually polar. Uh, only water actually has what we call a dipole moment or an actual change in charge across the molecule. So this molecule here is actually polar in terms of the molecule and CO2 is actually nonpolar. So a nonpolar molecule, like why does this matter? Well, a nonpolar molecule is going to have a weaker attraction with itself. Like a polar molecule kind of has like built-in charges. It's like one end of the molecule has a different charge than the other end. So if you stack two molecules on top of each other, they have like a built-in plus and minus that they can be attracted to. Like so if we notice hydrogen's more um, electronegative, or excuse me, hydrogen's less electronegative, oxygen's more electronegative, 
Oxygen picks up the partial negative. Hydrogens pick up the partial positive. If we stack two waters on top of each other, we have this like built-in attraction. We have this like electrostatic force of attraction between the plus and the minus charges. And it's just like built into the molecule. Now with CO2, you might think it has it too. You might think, okay, CO2, these bonds are polar. I end up with partial negative here, partial negative, partial positive in the middle. The problem is that charge is in the middle. The negative charge is on the outside. If I put a CO2 here to CO2 here, two negative charges bumping into each other. You actually get more repulsion than you do attraction. And so you just don't get this built-in charge. Now you might think, well, what about CO2 stacking and oxygen in the middle? The problem is you get the electron density of those orbitals getting in the way, repelling each other. And so you really have to picture almost like molecules oriented in the same direction. Are they attracted together? If no, then it's nonpolar. And so nonpolar means that the attractive forces are weaker. It's going to give it lower melting point trends, lower boiling point trends. And so usually things that are bigger have higher melting points and boiling points. CO2 is bigger than water, has a much lower melting point, much lower boiling point um, due to the weaker intermolecular forces that it has. So being able to identify a molecule as polar versus nonpolar might help us understand whether, whether or not it has really strong attractive forces or relatively weak attractive forces. So CO2 has a weaker attractive force. It's a gas at room temperature. Water stronger forces, liquid at room temperature. And so polarity has a big impact on properties. So being able to predict that from structure is something we want to do in this chapter. And then the second half of the chapter gets into bonding models. You might remember some of you, I don't know how many of you guys learned things like sp2, sp3. Anybody ever hear those phrases before? Um, hybrid orbital theory. OK, well, we'll talk about that. I think sometimes the reluctancy is not to put your hand up if you may or may not have heard something. MO theory, probably haven't heard this before. Like molecular orbital theory helps us understand um, how electrons for like diatomic molecules go into their bonding orbitals and helps us predict some of the properties of those type of molecules. So we'll talk, talk about some of those bonding go in this chapter. Okay, let's start off with an analogy with CCL4. CCL4 was one that we could do a Lewis structure from a dot picture or from the rules um, of counting electrons, distributing single bonds. But in chapter eight, we'd come up with this Lewis structure here. And so there's nothing wrong with this Lewis structure other than the real molecule doesn't necessarily look flat. Okay, and something we almost always do in chapter eight is sketch a Lewis structure where everything is just two-dimensionally on the paper. Like even when we were doing, remember SF6, we were just like writing all the fluorines in here. Like a real molecule is probably not gonna wanna be flat. Okay, some will be, so some will just exist within a single plane, but a lot of molecules are going, going to want to use three dimensions to separate their electron pairs. And so just because we do something flat in chapter eight, let's try not to trick ourselves into thinking the real molecule is flat necessarily. And so CCL4, probably not going to be a flat molecule because these bonds are electron pairs. And the question would be, how can they get as far away from each other as possible? So if we have four electron pairs on a single atom, the way geometrically they can get as far away from each other as possible is through a tetrahedron. So if we adopt a tetrahedral shape, now how do you do that? Well, I think if you picture just having two of the chlorines in the plane of your paper, and then imagine having a chlorine coming out at us and a chlorine going back. It's how we sketch this in three dimensions. So it's kind of sketching this picture here, but then also trying to see that whenever we write bonds without forward arrows coming in and out, that it's in the plane of the paper that we're writing, and then a wedge solid coming out at us, and a wedge backwards going into the plane. And so these are the shapes that you would get if you had a tetrahedron, which is this shape here. So a tetrahedron emerges if you have a carbon right in the middle, and then chlorines on the vertices. And so the name tetrahedron actually comes not necessarily because there's four chlorines, but because this shape here has four sides. Now, there's a reason why I point this out. There's going to be a structure later with six things that's an octa structure, that's an octahedral structure. And it's, again, not because there's eight things attached to a central atom. It's actually from six. But it's going to be from an eight-sided shape that emerges. But so we get this four-sided shape. Carbon's kind of in the middle. Chlorine's on the vertices. And then the bond angles here turn out to be just from geometry. We're not going to prove this. But if you go to geometry class, all these angles have to be exactly 109.5 degrees. So if you have exactly 109.5 degrees, then you get a perfect tetrahedron, where all those triangles on your tetrahedral face are exactly the same size as each other. 
And so then in terms of a space filling model, we have something like CCL4. Now, if I put another CCL4 molecule right next to CCL4, do you think it's gonna be polar or non-polar? Do you think we have a built-in attraction or a built-in almost repulsion? Probably repulsion, because we have the exact same charges. If you think of the negative charge from those four identical chlorines, the same charge on all sides of our molecule, CCL4 turns out to be a non-polar molecule. So non-polar in terms of that polarity trend, we'll do examples of polarity as we go along, but since we already talked a little bit about CO2 versus water, this is fitting into more like CO2, where the charges on all the sides of our molecule are exactly the same, we end up with a non-polar molecule. So we call CCL4 a tetrahedral molecule because it takes this tetrahedral geometry. Now what about other shapes? Well, yeah. Mm. Let's come back to that because like, like in a way, I'm just trying to like foreshadow the discussion of polarity, you know, so that if we can start thinking that some molecules, even though they have polar bonds, end up being nonpolar, that CCL4 is gonna fit that category being like CO2. Um, so the, the idea is, does one side of the molecule have a different charge than the other side? Like I wanna be able to put one CCL4 on one side, like if I have a CCL4, um, here, and I put another CCL4 right next to it, and I put another CCL4 like right here. Think about, is there like a plus minus attraction in the atoms that are in contact with each other? And if you notice, our chlorines are all negatively charged. That's repulsion, you know, there's not a built-in attraction. And that positive charge is like in the center, and like the atoms just can't get to it on the adjacent molecule and sense it and have that built-in attraction. So in order, we'll talk about this in chapter 11, but in order for CCL4 to interact, it has to induce a dipole moment. The electrons have to shift in such a way that one side of the molecule becomes even more negative charged, induces the other molecule to become more positively charged to get like an electrostatic attraction. And so that's why this molecule here, we could think of it as being nonpolar. So then I think the question becomes, well, what shape emerges from having only two pairs of electrons that are being shared instead of four, or having three pairs of electrons being shared instead of four. So if you have CO2, double bonds, BF3, we saw this Lewis structure before, having three electron pairs on the central atom. So what we're gonna think in terms of structure is look at a central atom in terms of its Lewis structure and sort of count how many pairs of electrons or how many different sets of electrons there are on a central atom. So like right here, we'd say three. For CO2, I'd say two. And again, we're not counting double bonds as two here. We're counting like double bonds saying, okay, these sets of electrons are one. These sets of electrons are another set of repulsion. So I have like two sets of electrons that are gonna repel each other. So if I have two domains, sometimes we call these things domains. So I have two domains that are gonna repel, repel each other and CO2, the way they can get as far away as possible is 180 degrees. So if I take CO2 with a 90 degree angle, we have these electrons interacting with these electrons really close together. 180 degrees is as best as they can do. And that's perfect. They're as far away as they can ever be, 180 degrees. And so we get a perfectly linear structure for something like CO2, be an example of something that takes that linear geometry. Then if I only have three domains that are trying to separate, three domains doesn't have to start using that third dimension yet. Three domains just simply says, well, what if we go perfectly 120 degrees away from each other. If the boron tried to come out of the page and we tried to use the third dimension, we're gonna reduce those bond angles and put those angles closer together. That's worse, they repel each other more. So the way three pairs of electrons or three domains can get away from each other is through a trigonal planar geometry, 120 degree bond angles. This is what BF3 does. And then the tetrahedral geometry are things that form where we have four domains. So if we have four domains, like say four bonds rep repelling each other like in CF4, then we take this tetrahedral geometry. That's how four pairs of electrons can get away from each other as far as possible. So the shapes of molecules start to emerge as the central atoms have lone pairs that are trying to separate. And then when we start to kick into things like water, let's say, so if we have water, remember we have two lone pairs that this is kind of like one domain 
this is kind of like two domains, and then three and four. So I have four domains on water, so for water, it's gonna to wanna to put electron pairs into two of these domains, and then the other domains being for the bond with hydrogen. So water, we're gonna see, kicks into having its bond closer to 109.5 than 180 because of those lone pairs repelling each other. So I just wanna look looking at other shapes, and we'll be looking at things like ammonia, water, and their geometries as we continue along, continue along in chapter nine. All right, that'll do it for today. Um, we'll continue in chapter nine on Friday. Have a great morning, wherever it is. Great morning, everybody.